Member of Parliament, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Professor Dale Webber, CD Principal of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, um, Ambassador Dr. The Honorable Richard Bernal, uh, Professor of Practice Solisis, um, the other ministers who I will greet as we await their arrival, um, colleagues from the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, headed by the Permanent Secretary Dermond Spence, um, Carl James, the Honorable Carl James, Chairman of the Sugar Association of Jamaica, sorry, of the Caribbean. Ambassador Derek Haven, Chairman, All Island Cane Farmers Association. Uh, Mr. Richard Pandohi, CEO of the Separate Group. Wentworth Charles, former Chairman of the SCJ Holdings Limited. And Delroy Armstrong, representing um, Pan Caribbean Sugar Company. Other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all good afternoon. Mine is the pleasure of guiding us through uh, this auspicious occasion. I'm quite pleased to be in good company. And among our, our, ourselves this afternoon is a distinguished gentleman in whose honor we have assembled, um, a fellow registrar, registrar of the UWI Mona campus, uh, Dr. Donovan Stanbury, as we have come to celebrate the launch of his new book, How Trade Liberal Liberalization Affects a Sugar-Dependent Community in Jamaica, From Global Action to Local Impact. It is so good to see you. I'm quite pleased that you are here, and I'd like to, on his behalf, welcome you. Could I just ask everyone to take a minute just to ensure that your cell phones are put, have been put on, on, on silent or on vibrate? <coughs> And as you do that, let me also in, invite Deacon David Smalling to come and to offer prayer. I invite you to bow your heads. Eternal Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercies that was extended towards mankind. And to the mighty God, as we gather in this fashion, I pray, Eternal Father, that your blessing will be upon us. Bless each and every single one here today who have made a sacrifice, mighty God, to come in support of the launch of this book. I pray equally, mighty God, for every single one that will speak today. I pray for every single listening here. I pray, Eternal Father, even for the one, mighty God, the author of this book, I pray you will always guide him and bless him and inspire him, mighty God, to continue this journey. I pray, mighty God, that your spirit of mighty God blessing will be upon the moderator today. You will guide him, O oh dear God, as you guide today's proceeding. Have your divine blessing, mighty God, upon this service. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, mine is the pleasure now, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing the principal of the UWI Mono Campus, Professor Dale Weber, as he comes to offer the welcome and the opening remarks. Professor Weber has had a distinguished career in coastal ecology and environmental management, and he has a strong and consistent record of teaching, graduate supervision, administration, and research excellence, which, which spans some 30 years of service to the UWI Mona. Professor Weber was appointed to the position of Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Mona Campus in 2018, and having served previously as the Pro Vice Chancellor for Graduate Studies in 2015 and 2018. Professor Weber, as you know, has had an excellent record of public service. He has served as Chairman of the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica, the Board of Directors, Convener of the Cape Environmental Sciences Panel for the CXC, and also Chairman of CL Environmental Company. He is married to a UWI Marine ecologist, Professor Mona Weber, and often he quips that he loves Mona. You, you, you can interpret that <laughs> either way, but Professor Weber has two daughters, Marissa and Deanna, and interestingly, both are pursuing degrees in environmental engineering and oceanography, respectively. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome our campus principal. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith, our Master of Ceremonies. Honorable Colonel Charles Jr., Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. Dr. Richard Bernal, Professor of Practice in Salisas. I have to look at the man carefully you now. Dr. Donovan Stanbury, author who we celebrate today. Members of the university family, members of the public, 
Friends and colleagues, good afternoon to you all. Welcome to the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. And I say that welcome in a special way. This is the first time in two years that we've had a function at the Undercroft. And thank you for making it possible. Without you, it would not be possible. We're gathered on a special occasion for a special individual. The University of the West Indies, as you know, pride ourselves in being the number one university in the Caribbean. We can go on to all the other accolades, but we've built ourselves on looking at the research that makes a difference. Revitalizing Caribbean development has been our theme for the last strategic plan. Our next strategic plan, which is about to be rolled out, has added to that revenue revolution. Sugar has been at the heart of Jamaica and the Caribbean for many years, and the liberalization has changed much of that. Research, which is what we are known for, what we are good at, is important and must be taken to the fore. I was approached some time ago to take on a student. Now, I had really had enough students, and they had really given me enough gray hairs. So when this student came along, the first answer was no. But after a while, I learned more about the student, and you will hear more about the student too. Environment, water, agriculture, those are areas that I love. Joining with a friend, Derek Deslandes, we decided we would take on this student and try and figure out the way forward because he was well known in those areas. Little did we know that the student would become the teacher and we would then start learning about George Beckford and Norman Gervin and all the history that went with sugar in Jamaica and social situations in Jamaica. We looked at this and for me, it was very special because this book is the manifestation of a PhD thesis from Donovan Stanbury. I was really interested in the environmental state that went with the sugar industry. I was interested in looking at protocols, looking at how we could improve, what would be the right goals to set. I was interested in endangered species and degraded areas. I was interested in bacteria and BOD. I had no interest, but soon had to get interest in areas that would take me towards new knowledge and new growth. And that is what learning is all about. And that's what the university is all about. We're here and academics publish. Administrators facilitate those who publish. To have an administrator who is therefore into publishing, we have the best of both worlds, and we've reaped twice. Donovan is tenacious. He's thoughtful. He's dedicated, but he's determined, and I can tell you he determined. He's focused, and he's fascinated. And if you ever see him fascinated and start articulate, you, you try to figure out how do you calm him down. He's methodical, and he's meticulous. He led me to a new set of vocabulary. When I saw SDA, I thought Seventh-day Adventist Church, only to know that there's no sugar-dependent area. As you know, just heard I'm married to a marine biologist, so when I say C, I think C. No, C means a strategic environmental assessment. And there are many things that you learn as you go through such an exercise. But for me, the greatest goal and the greatest benefit was watching this individual grow. And today, we see the end product of a growth, which is from an individual who has changed track, changed cycles, but maintained the breadth of knowledge and the opportunities that they have offered. I'm very pleased to share this afternoon with you, Dr. Stanbury, and your family, and your friends, and those who influenced your getting here. I look forward to this book launch, and if you haven't read it yet, read chapter seven. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Weber. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to a point in our gathering this afternoon where it is important that we give you a sugary grain-like insight into the book. Not only will it be spicy, but it will be sweet. Could I ask you to put your hands together and to welcome to the lecture Dr. Richard Bernal to give an overview of the book. Master of Ceremonies, 
Dr. Smith, University Registrar, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Mona Campus, Professor Dale Weber, who we should give a special recognition to in supervising the PhD dissertation, which became the updated book that we now have available to us. Let me specially welcome the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. His career clearly demonstrates that the reward for good work is more work, because the Prime Minister keeps moving him from one difficult task to another. Um, so we are very happy he could join us this evening. Um, faculty, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mona campus. It is my pleasant task to provide a brief review of Donovan Stanbury's How Trade Liberalization Affects a Sugar-Dependent Community in Jamaica, Global Action, Local Impact. Let me preface this by saying that conventional trade theory says we're all better off if we trade and that even the least of the developed countries has some comparative advantage. That's a highly simplified model. In fact, it's a fable. The reality has been challenged by the structuralists, the dependent school, and the Marxists by pointing out that in the real world, you have differences in levels of development, differences in power, differences in ability to produce productively, and that these differences along with the dominance of the multinational corporation distorts trade. And what happens is that in trade, and free trade is the so-called desirable goal, but trade liberalization to the extent that it approaches this is supposed to be good. But you do have winners and losers. And often those losers are small producers or small developing countries. In the beginning of the book, the author sets out to chronicle what happens when global events have an impact in a local community. In this regard, he has done us a service because he has provided a case study of a sugar-dependent area, in particular Veer around the Money Musk area, in Clarendon to show exactly what has happened. I say he do, does us a service because sugar has been the backbone of the Jamaican economy for most of the 400 years that it has been operating in Jamaica. And often the people who don't benefit significantly from the industry, whether it was in good times or bad times, are the workers. So he has on behalf of countless generations of workers in the sugar industry recorded their story. And incidentally, he's ideally suited to do this. He grew up in a sugar producing area in Clarendon. He studied agriculture, he administered agriculture, and he has brought all of that together in this outstanding book. In the second chapter, he sets the stage by outlining a model of pure plantation economy as set out by Lloyd Best and updated to include the operation of multinational corporations by George Beckford. He then applies that model to the reality and shows how well it explains the fact that many of these plantation economies do not develop, in fact, they experience what Beckford calls persistent poverty, and they experience underdevelopment. In closing that analysis in chapter three, he sets out what should happen for sustainable people-centered development, in contrast to what has happened. In chapter four, he looks at the turbulent post-independence period. And he notes that when the sugar industry began to experience problems from competition of lower cost producers in the global economy, 
that the British implemented preferential trade arrangements. These arrangements were as much concerned about social stability in Jamaica and the Caribbean as it was with the profitability of sugar refining in England. As I say, in chapter four, he turns to the turbulent period after independence. And note here, sugar production has declined every year since 1965. And during that period, what we have seen is less and less importance of the industry. And this is very significant because it was the backbone of industry in the country. Sugar was not only planting sugar and producing sugar. It had many other aspects of manufacturing, rum, molasses. It required chemists, it required engineers, agronomists. It was a critical industry. Well, as the historians would say, there are periods in the history of sugar where there is gall and wormwood. It seems that the 60s ushered in such a period. In this period, the industry struggled. The industry struggled until the point where the special and differential arrangements were dismantled in the World Trade Organization. Ironically, at the behest of other developing countries, such as Thailand, India, and Brazil. It prompts one to wonder, is there no room in the global economy for small producers? This is something we have to come back to. Now, the fact that the external arrangements changed in an adverse way does not excuse us from recognizing that there were weaknesses in domestic policy and there were delays in taking remedial action, which may have uh, stopped the deterioration in the industry. In chapter six, he recounts how these preferential arrangements were allowed to be pulled down, the story of how they were dismantled, the struggle to remain that, uh, keep them in place. It was part of a global movement to dismantle preferential arrangements, which I think is unfortunate and short-sighted. He chronicles the various attempts to salvage the industry. He chronicles the withdrawal of foreign ownership, its replacement by the government, including a period of sugar cooperatives, and then the divestment of the industry. I note in all these changes that it is ironic that the most consistently profitable and, and efficient, judged by uh, production yields, sugar estate is a privately owned one. It's ironic given all the changes in the industry. The collapse of the sugar industry is emblematic of what happens when developed and developing countries trade and when small and large countries trade and we are multinational corporations internalize the entire production, marketing and sale of a commodity. But often when we look at trade analysis, we stop at the level of macroeconomics, exports, imports, foreign exchange, employment, taxation. The real story, and this is his concern, is the human story. Because we talk glibly about reallocation of resources, land, labor, capital, but labor is people. And this is the story of the people who suffered from that external trade. He does that, I provide in a case study in chapter seven. And that centers on where that community was in terms of a standard of living, a rural lifestyle in the 2008 to 2010 period. That is preparatory to chapter eight, which looks at how the government tried to assist through 
a strategy of adaptation and the shortcomings of that period, which leads us to where the industry is today. And in this regard, I am really looking forward to the minister's remarks about the future of the industry. But let me say that this is an important economic and sociological analysis of where we are today and how we got there. Um, being the pragmatist that he is, in a short final chapter, he provides some suggestions as to what are the critical factors for, let us say, optimistically, revival of the industry. In closing, let me say that I highly recommend this book. The subject matter is important. It's clearly written and well organized and documented in detail. And the argument is supported by empirical evidence. I believe for all those interested in development and all those interested in Jamaica and its future, that this is essential reading. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And you would have noted the many references to trade, and you, you, you would understand my saying that that's important because we certainly believe what the ambassador says. He is a senior associate with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He would he would have served as Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs. He is a member of the board of directors of the International, sorry, the Inter-American Development Bank. He was a chief trade negotiator at CARICOM, Jamaica's ambassador to the United States, and I could go on and on. Clearly, he did an excellent job of providing the global and local context within which, trade context within which the, the book was written. So thank you ever so much, Ambassador Bernal. To now sweeten the pot is the son of the author, um, Stephen Stanbury and Friends. And Stephen is going to be presenting, sharing with us a musical presentation. He is a student at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. Could you make him welcome? Thank you. 
Stephen Stanbury and friends. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready to roll the sugar cube. And to do that will be the Honorable Pernell Charles, Jr., Member of Parliament, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. Uh, Minister Charles was appointed Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries on January 11, 2022. And prior to that, he was Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change. He is also a two-time member of parliament, currently serving in South East Clarendon. Uh, Minister Charles is a former government senator and member of the cabinet where he served as a minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation with responsibility for water, housing, and infrastructure. And prior to that, he served as Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade with responsibility for diaspora affairs. Minister Charles also served as Minister of State in the Ministry of National Security. He is an attorney at law and he practices in Jamaica and in the United States of America. He is the former president of the Law Society and former Guild President of the University of the West Indies where he earned two honors degrees, a Bachelor of Science, double major in Biochemistry and Zoology and a Bachelor of Laws. And he also holds a Master of Laws degree from the George Washington Law School in Washington, D.C. He was born with a passion for community service. And as a youth advocate, he participates in a number of community activities. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome to address the assembly today, our guest speaker, Minister Pernell Charles, Jr. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Smith. Permit me, of course, to acknowledge uh, my professor, lecturer, colleague, friend, Professor Weber, the principal and pro-vice chancellor of UAE, Mona, um, who you welcome me home. And we have had many experiences on campus. I should say to you, thank you for all of the uh, encouragement and time that you spend with your students. Um, of course, Ambassador Dr. Richard Bernal, who, when I left here and went to that other place, was just as kind um, as a mentor. But permit me to also acknowledge the man of the hour, our author and former permanent secretary and proud father of Stephen, right? Who, who clearly got his talent from his mother. <laughs> um, of course, I acknowledge all of the other distinguished persons here, but I would, uh, would be remiss of me to not acknowledge my permanent secretary um, who is there waving at his hand in the air, uh, Dr. Spence, sorry, Professor Spence. Um, and I know that so many others are here. I see the indomitable uh, Peter Knight out in the day um, joining us and other friends, Nigel and CTT Palmer and everyone. It's an important day. It's important for us to be here. So we welcome the members of the media and all it's a pleasure for me to be here at this book launch on a critical topic, critical to me, not just because I have been given the responsibility to be Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries at perhaps a time when this subject area will become most critical, facing a pandemic, facing wars, and facing the culmination and exacerbation of a lot of challenges that lead to uncertainty with regards to our food security. But it's important for us to note that Dr. Donovan Stanberry has taken the time to chronicle and 
to extend to us his thoughts, his scholarly examination, his reason, his experiences as a permanent secretary, his experiences um, inspired by his growing up in race course in Clarendon, in the heart of the sugarcane belt, um, and has done what I've always thought that many in his position should do, to record your opinions and your evaluation for the benefit of many who will come. And I must tell you, you know, my father has four books going 400, because he's writing at least 396 more. Um, and I know how the experience and the time, uh, it, the, what the intricacies of sitting down and really getting it right. And so I applaud you, Donovan, for the work that you have done, particularly um, in an area that is so critical. Critical because the book analyzes the social and the environmental impact of the liberalization of the EU's sugar market and the consequent erosion of the Jamaican preferential prices in that market on the money musk sugar dependent area. An area where again, perhaps not coincidentally, I have been given the responsibility to lead as member of parliament. And I was just remarking that I will be coming to your church again very soon. For those of you who don't know, um, Mr. Christopher Sergio, perhaps you don't know, um, I don't know if you go to the churches often, but it's my friend, so I can trouble him. But Donovan, what do they call it? Is it Pastor, Reverend, Bishop? All Which one? Of All of the above. <laughs> but undoubtedly, you have a wealth of experience, a wealth of experience based on your time at the ministry. Um, and also, I believe that it has contributed to the ability for you to really go in depth with your understanding of the sugarcane industry and to give us what can only be defined as a unique perspective into the many challenges that have impacted the many sugarcane growing communities across Jamaica, including Money Musk, um, over the years. Now, I have spent some time, perhaps not born in Clarendon, Mr. Knight, but definitely with a father who uh, was a trade unionist in that area and who um, consequently would have had a seat in Clarendon right there for more than two decades. I have my share of understanding of the range of challenges that have confronted the industry over the last few years, caused by a lot of what we define in terms of the loss of our preferential markets in Europe, a decrease in the global market prices, as well as some inadequacies, let's call it that, in our own local industry. What has happened uh, has been devastating to the livelihoods of families and communities that were dependent on sugarcane. And if you get into the area, you'll realize that it's not just about the shutting down of the factory. The sugarcane industry integrated into the community led to several benefactors and perhaps even more detractors. It became much more than just employment. It offered water to communities. It offered services to communities. And you don't realize it more than when you become the member of parliament of one of those communities who have now lost the benefit of all that was gained from that industry. Because the responsibility shifts to who? Yes, you don't want to say it, but it's true. So you're looked to, and then you get a, an acute appreciation um, of the challenges that were faced by the industry, as well as the impact. Notwithstanding the challenges that we faced with sugar declining, we are a resilient people and community, and we have repositioned the resources and skills that we have in large part. And we believe that there is a future for the new face of Jamaica's sugar industry. And Ambassador Bernal, you remarked that you're waiting to hear but I do not want to give a declaration 
on sugar. What I will do, though, is remark that we believe there is a future and that even as we diversify some of the sugar lands into other productive areas used for planting of orchard crops which will provide employment and new investment opportunities, uh, we as a government will continue and have been facilitating improvements in the former sugarcane growing communities. It is today that we had a chance to sit down with our senior executives at the ministry and part of our discussion surrounded exactly this question. Uh, we have done a lot and will continue to provide training for displaced workers in the alternative livelihoods as well as technical support to boost production. But even with those social interventions, we recognize and we have to appreciate the deleterious effect that this displacement has caused former sugarcane workers and communities, such as Money Musk. And we are committed to finding a solution that is beneficial to all. I am one who have received the calls, calls from, for instance, Christopher, who is a former sugarcane worker, uh, who reaches out to me from time to time, asking what exactly of us now uh, but the reality is, sugarcane continues to play an important role in our nation's business. We have a responsibility to ensure its sustainability insofar as that is possible. And this requires increased productivity. It requires us to look towards diversification, good agricultural practices, and cauterization of illicit trade something which I was not quite aware of before uh, getting into the ministry and understanding uh, how much that has affected the industry, Mr. Wentworth Charles, former chairman, uh, who I would never live down if I had not acknowledged you, sir. So the government is actively working to ensure the country can serve the demand for brown sugar in the local market, as well as to export to the region. Currently, we still import granulated sugar. And so we see this as an opportunity for persons to invest in the manufacturing of granulated sugar. And this would serve to reduce our imports and provide much needed employment. In order though for us to achieve this diversification and expansion, we have to address the challenges faced in the industry, which includes unstable production, low quality, and loss of revenue due to inefficiency. Some of that inefficiency is wrapped up in what I came to understand as the expanded role of the industry, as more than just a business, as a provider of services for communities. From 2019, there has been a steady decline in the amount of canes harvested and crushed, moving from 736,515 tons to just below 500,000 tons in 2021. Concomitant with this decline in sugarcane production is a decline in sugar sales for 2021 in both local and export markets, moving from 42,612 tons in 2020 to 31,000 tons. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we are to overcome these challenges, there must then be greater use of research and the application of science and modern technology to the industry to promote increased levels of production and productivity. We want our farmers to use the best technologies available and to engage in the best agronomic practices that will bring increased yields per hectare. It is only then that our farmers will make the desired return on their investments. Increased production also requires that our farmers invest in increased irrigation and overall farm care as well as new technology. And so therefore I am challenging the Sugar Industry Authority to use its expertise to guide farmers on the varieties that are most suited for cultivation and which will lead to the best yields. At the Ministry, our commitment and our belief is that these challenges are not insurmountable, but instead provides us with an opportunity for innovation, an opportunity to reorient and to redirect 
from which a stronger industry can emerge. And I know I've had the discussion with many of what to do. A matter of fact, one person actually gave me an analogy, an example, and said that, Minister, you are to do with the sugar industry what we do with sugar in tea, just dilute it. That's how bad it was. The reality for us as a country is that we, we have to work smart. and We have to make decisions that are going to benefit generations to come. Uh, the analysis by Dr. Stanberry is one such evaluation that will help us in determining exactly what is the best position and positioning for our country and people. So I just want to, before I close, commend you, Dr. Stanberry, author, for putting together this very insightful book. It is something that we will rely on and based on the key features uh, that were highlighted uh, by Dr. Bernal, and the key features in the publication documenting the experiences of other countries in restructuring their sugar industry, as well as how the Worthy Park Estate has managed its own enterprises efficiently over the past 200 years, I'm confident that this book will prove to be a resourceful tool for all stakeholders, particularly for us, Permanent Secretary Spence, at the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. Uh, Dr. Sanberry, let me say on behalf of the several persons who um, say to themselves so many times that we want to write, because I know that Peter Knight is writing his book. You've you you reached chapter seven yet? Yes, so many of us talk about writing. Nigel Myrie has spoken about writing, his experiences and others. Uh, let this be an encouragement. Perhaps you may not find the time to go and do the doctorate. But I do want to encourage um, all, as I close, to find the time. If you have had years of experience, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe 50 years like Dermot spends um, in the industry, it's important to chronicle your experience so that new persons like myself, new ministers coming on, will have the benefit of picking up evaluating, assessing, and even if not agreeing, being able to make considerations on your well thought out and analyzed opinions. So Dr. Sanberry, we applaud you. We applaud your book. Um, and I certainly on behalf of the government and the others who I know would want to be here, uh, want to uh, say to you that we are simply waiting. Um, I am told by Dr. Smith that you might be doing a volume two and volume three, and other areas in agriculture and fisheries. So we're waiting on those uh, for us to be invited to the further book launches. One love. Thank you, thank you, Minister, for so ably articulating how uh, Dr. Stanberg's analysis aligns with, connects to the policy and strategic initiatives of the Ministry of Agriculture and fisheries. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely proud of and happy for uh, Registrar uh, Stanbury. There was a time, you, 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 you see that, uh, registrars were thought of as only as, 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 as administrators. But here it is, we have a registrar who has proven himself as an academician. And Dr. Stanbury is quite unassuming, quite technically sound. He is a firm believer in people and in their potential, and today we have come to celebrate him. It would be remiss of me to not uh, recognize publicly the members of his family here present. Could I so ask that you stand wherever you are so that we can duly um, acknowledge you? Wife? Mrs. Stanbury, great. Con let's, absolutely, congratulations. Thank you, thank you so very much. Dr. Stanbury is the registrar UWI Mona, and he has been in this role since August 2019. 
He began his professional career in 1992 as a lecturer of mathematics at the College of Arts, Science and Technology, and having graduated with honors from the Moscow Agricultural Academy. Hmm. <laughs> with a master's degree in agricultural economics in June 1992. He's not an ordinary man, he is unassuming. In September 1994, he moved on to the Planning Institute of Jamaica, where he assumed the position of senior economist and head of the agricultural unit. He was then recruited to the then Ministry of Public Utilities and Transport, a senior director with responsibility for water. In 1998, 1998, he was transferred to the Ministry of Water as Senior Director and was subsequently promoted to Chief Technical Director in that ministry in the year 2000. In November 2004, he was appointed Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Land and Environment, from where he was transferred to the Ministry of Agriculture and Lands in April 2006 as Permanent Secretary. When the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries was merged with the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce in March 2016, uh, Dr. Stanbury remained a permanent secretary then, and during his long career in the civil service, he would have represented many times the government of Jamaica at many international fora in the areas of water policy and management, agriculture, environment, MSME development, industry, and commerce. He has negotiated numerous loans and grants with international development partners for a plethora of projects. He is not an ordinary man. Uh, notwithstanding his hectic workload as a senior civil servant, he was able to complete a master's in business administration for the Mona School of Business and Management with distinction, and later a doctorate in environmental management from U the UWI in 2018. He is not an ordinary man. I, I bet you don't know that uh, Dr. Stanbury is a certified teacher of the Russian language. He is not an ordinary man. And in recognition of his outstanding public service, uh, Dr. Stanbury, as a Justice of the Peace, was conferred with the Order of Distinction Commander Class by the Government of Jamaica in 2018. And he is currently an elder uh, minister <laughs> in the Church of God, Seventh day. I I've said all of that to, to, to give you some insights, you see, because the book which we're going to hear a little bit more about. The book was inspired by Dr. Stanbury's childhood experiences growing up in Vera Clarendon in the heart of the sugarcane belt. Specifically, the book seeks to analyze the social and environmental impact of the liberalization of the EU's sugar market and the consequent erosion of Jamaica's preferential prices in the market on the Money Musk sugar dependent area, which basically covers an entire there and that's located in southeast and southwest Clarendon. Dr. Stanbury is now going to come and he's going to wet our taste buds and he's going to uh, do an official reading and then he'll engage us in a brief period of questions and answers. Ladies and gentlemen, would it be too much to ask you to put your hands together and to welcome <laughs> the author, Dr. Donovan Stanbury. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me say this is not a bestseller or a juicy autobiography. So I thought long and hard when my handlers, Tracy Hamilton and Associates, tried to prevail on me to read excerpts from the book. I don't do well in reading. I usually speak from my head. But I will oblige today, if it means that you are going to buy the book. <laughs> so, speakers before me have already spoken to <clears throat> what the book is about. I'll just try and cover the entire span of the book on the four or five headings. And for each, I'll just read an excerpt as they say, to whet the appetite. So, what was the inspiration? Page one. I spent most of my first 18 years 
Growing up in racecourse, we are Clarendon, and I'm proud to have Ambassador Sheila Sealy Mantique, who has shared that experience with me, in the heart of the cane growing belt. My own life has been profoundly influenced and shaped by the sugar industry in that part of Jamaica. I've had a lifelong fascination with sugar, which pervades the atmosphere during crop time. From the smell of the sugar in the boilers at Money Musk, to the frightening scene of a cane chuck, of a cane field rather burning in preparation for harvest. You really believe the Lord going to come when you see that. To the overloaded chucks and cane carts on the road heading for the factory, to the cane cutters fully covered by the black suit of the, of the burned cane and armed with a sharp machete, to the repugnant odor of the dunder running in gullies as waste from the distillery to the Raya Mineral River and ultimately the Caribbean Sea. But more than these physical images, as I grew up, I always noticed the predominance of poverty in Veer, especially during the out-of-crop season, and how the town of Lionel Town became alive with activities and paydays, and the general bustle of economic and social activities during crop as against out-of-crop. By the way, for the people of Veer, Time is divided between crop when we reach when we reap the sugar cane and out of crop when the pangs of poverty bite. So I'll stop there for the inspiration. It says a lot more, but let us go to what the issue is. So you can write this down and run to it when you buy the book. Page 98. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the government got involved. Well, first of all, the sugar industry peaked at, in 1965 when we produced over 500,000 tons of sugar. And within five years of that, the Tate and Lido own over 70% of the industry indicated to the Shira government that they wanted to be out. And Prime Minister Shira, and they wanted to be out of sugarcane growing, but they wouldn't give up on the factory and the rum, which were the more lucrative parts of the industry. So government really got involved in 1970. Prime Minister Shira bought Bernard Lodge and like, no, brought Monimus rather, and Froome from Tate and Lyle, and Bernard Lodge from the United Sugar, uh, United Food Company. But it was really in 1972 that we had the real action in the sugar industry. That's where government in involvement started with the privatize with the corporate, the cooperative experiment of Mr. Manley. And of course, by the late 1970s, all the sugar factories were just collapsing because of debt and lack of profitability. And the government became the main player and formed what was called the National Sugar Company. By 1994, government divested to the private sector with a clean slate and by 1998, they had to take it back with all the debts for one dollar. So, this excerpt summarizes what really happened during the time of government involvement since 1970. Government's involvement did not result in any major investment in industry, nor the infusion of new technical management. That is, save and accept a World Bank loan under the Seaga administration in the early uh, 80s 
that provided irrigation for Money Musk. The financial freefall therefore continued for over a decade, forcing government to seek to rescue the industry through privatization in late 1993. Significant policy preparation and consultation attended this privatization attempt with respect to the institutional arrangement of the industry and the privatization framework. Notwithstanding the commendable performance of the divested entities, estates, in relation to production and productivity, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the industry for those four years, <clears throat> Within four years, the divested assets were handed back to the government for one dollar with a staggering $2.9 billion debt. So we have the failed cooperative exper experiment and the failed divestment. In all of this, the wider imperatives of diversification, improving efficiency in the industry, social transformation of sugar-dependent areas, as well as the environmental sustainability of the industry, were not considered. Government was always interested in getting out of the death, which was like a fiscal albatross around its neck. And very little thought about how, we'll, how the social conditions are to be addressed as well as the environmental conditions. My next heading is the inertia. Because Richard Bernal is correct. The EU preferential market did not collapse overnight. It was coming from as far back as the Uruguay round of GATT negotiations that started in 1986, when the world insisted that we have to free up agriculture trade. So it should have taken no government at all. And here, Minister, I talk about government in a generic sense. So, Why this inertia? We know from as early as 1986 that this was coming. But everybody just continues as if these high prices in the preferential market would last forever. The government, and when I say government, I mean all the governments, has to shoulder some responsibility for this lack of modernization, not only as a major producer since the late 70s, but for resisting attempts of private estates to mechanize harvesting. It is recorded, and I believe, I might have been a little boy, but I've read Levy, who I'm happy to, be, to have here this afternoon, and a gentleman by the name of Fio, that these attempts were resisted because privatization, whilst it would increase efficiency and profitability in the sector, would, <laughs> would eliminate the need to employ a large pool of semi-skilled people in the sugar belt. This inertia with respect to investment in industry is puzzling, given the critical importance of the sugar industry to the nation in terms of foreign exchange earnings, employment, and maintaining the social fabric of the sugar-dependent areas. Could this paralysis on the part of government and other industry players be symptomatic of a deep-seated dependency that the plantation economy engendered over such a long time? Could this inaction serve to perpetuate poverty in the sugar-dependent areas, with the industry only serving as a large sponge to mop up the large pool of rural unemployed people 
and keep them in low-paying jobs? These are questions that we have to ponder. No ACP country, no government with any Ministry of Foreign Affairs that worth its salt could deny that the move to liberalization of agricultural trade was long in the making and was intensifying by the year. But we were paralyzed and we did little. So what was the response when the curtains finally came down? What was the response when in 2005, following a challenge, funny enough, from other developing countries, Brazil, Thailand, and well, Australia is not quite developing, to this non-reciprocal, discriminatory regime whereby farmer colonies like Jamaica were enjoying high prices in a market which was shut to more efficient producers in the developing world. So we go to page 220. And we read. So let me just say before I read quickly that government strategy was twofold. The EU gave us a little money as compensation. People like former Prime Minister PJ Patterson have heard him said publicly, having been critical to the negotiation of the first sugar protocol under the Lome Convention. And being a lawyer himself, he has said that there were perhaps grounds for challenging the EU for really renouncing the sugar protocol, which when you read it, it says it is of indefinite duration. So when it was clear that the EU didn't have the stomach to defend the preferential arrangements. I remember, I you know, as much as we are colonies of those European powers, um, economics trump over sentiments and love every time. Because the very EU was facing a huge bill every year to maintain farm subsidies to their own people and to maintain this preferential regime. So the EU didn't really have a stomach to fight the guys who challenged the regime because they themselves were trying to see how they could penetrate the markets of the very Brazil and Thailand and other developing countries which were shut out of this arrangement. So the EU said, you guys are not worth much to me anymore. We are not as strategic as before, as in the days of European settlement and rivalry. So I'm going to dispense with this thing and give you a little pocket money. Call euphemistically call accompanying measures that according to the late Roger Clark was a funeral grant. So what was the strategy? The strategy said the government said, okay, we're going to use a little funeral grant, 84, well, it's, it's more than a funeral grant, it's, it's big money in, in, in our reality. I think it was about 84 million euros. The government said, okay, we're going to use it to finally address some of the social issues and we're going to divest our interests and the private sector will do the investments and um, bring in the management and all of that. So, I read. The program for social transformation of SDAs, that is sugar development areas, Commenced in earnest in early 2009 under Minister Tufton, following the development of the Sugar Area Development Programs in 2008. 
Under this program, the government expended over 9.3 billion in all the SDAs in Jamaica, including over 2.2 billion in the Veer area in Monimusk. In terms of grants to vulnerable redundant workers, housing development, Cane Road expansion, development of agro parks, skills training, rehabilitation of sporting facilities, and a variety of small infrastructure projects. And this program represented the most expansive in terms of scope and intensive in terms of the period of implementation. A socioeconomic program ever implemented in the Monimus SDA. So in truth, the government did spend big money. And I'm sure MP driving through Veer will see the signs all over, you know. This thing was repaired by the sugar transformation program, etc. So that was the response, and of course over a two-year period, we divested um, five estates. And that was a big achievement, you know. Uh, Minister Tufton would often say that, you know, he was able to do that without one day of industrial action, which was a big feat. So we did that. What was the impact? So, Let's read the impact quickly. Let's go to page 110. The social impact of the divestment has also been evidenced in reduced numbers of entertainment events in the communities, reduced support for sports, and a marked rise in criminal activities, notably pre their last name. The Pan Caribbean Sugar Company, to which we divested the Monomous Estate, often complain of theft of their equipment, fertilizer, oil, etc. However, when the people in the community were surveyed, they claim that because of how they were treated, they no longer felt that they had an obligation to protect the property of the estate. They didn't feel that they, were, they had a stake in the enterprise. It is interesting that no less a person than the commissioner, then commissioner of police, Dr. Carl Williams, in a speech to business leaders, leaders carried in the Gleaner of September 29, 2016, made an association between the spike in criminal activities in Clarendon and Westmoreland to the decline in sugar. In that speech, the commissioner said, and I quote, we have seen in St. James, in Westmoreland, in Clarendon, the decline of sugar, particularly in Westmoreland and Clarendon, which were one sugar belt, sugar, is on the decline and crime is on the rise. And finally, the empirical evidence from the research that is reported in this book. The evidence from the survey of former sugar workers and residents of the monomous area as well as a case study of the wider Monomus area, indicate that residents did not perceive any improvement in their quality of life. 
residents stated that their quality of life worsened, although they were able to meet their basic needs, thanks to remittances and the help of family and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if the survey will tell the full story. But for anybody who knows Vera, it's the only place in Jamaica I know that look worse today than 40 years ago. And this has not been hyperbolic. Nothing has been able to replace the sugar cane to date. I want to close by saying one thing. And I want to thank Dr. David Simit for this. Okay, when I thought my literature review was complete, he sent me back to some sources. Oh, I was mad, but I'm happy he did. And some literature he directed me to. I found a work by the famous economist Joseph Stiglitz. And the famous economist, development economist, <coughs> Sen, who developed the human development index. They were commissioned by the then French president in 2008 to find a set of matrices, a set of matrix that really look at human development outside of the traditional macroeconomic indices. Because according to the president, the then president, he's sort of flamboyant, but he had a lot of sense, Zarkovsky. He said that statistics must measure what matters to people. And when I read the report from Stiglitz, I thought I was reading something from a sociologist and not an economist. Stiglitz said that figures can never adequately convey the devastating impact of unemployment. Because not only means that somebody has lost his livelihood, it means that that person has lost his dignity and feel that in some ways he or she, Lynette Vassar, is less than a person. And I thought of it and uh, <laughs> what the UR didn't tell you <laughs> is that I was unemployed for a short while. And I would see my wife go to work every morning and my son go to school. I was quite unemployed. I was between jobs. But I was without salary for four months. And when they gone, I sat at my step and just looking out like a, a madman. So when we say unemployment in Veer, people don't know what it means. When a man get up and can't find food for his family and cannot send his children to school, he feels that he's less than a person. And I think MP, and I'm glad that you are the MP. By the way, I invited the other MP in Southwest um, he couldn't make it, I apologize for him. But policies and development initiatives have to address people's needs and make people feel like persons, valuable members of the society. And what I bemoan about Veer is not so much a fact that both BNS and Sajikor has, have exited Lionel Town. And you know when that happens, they tell you that nothing happening here, eh? 
what I bemoan about Veer is not the utter dilapidation, the, the cane field is that just in just lying there waste, thousands of acres. What is a young boy on the roadside waiting for the MP to pass through? And MP, if you think it's you, one of the problem, you'll be a person like myself. Because they're going to quote you that he will lend it to the poor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You did enjoy that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stanberg, we are very proud of him. Uh, at this time, the author has kindly consented to responding to any questions uh, any member of the audience may have. If so, we invite you to go to the microphones that are um, there in the, in, uh, amongst the, the, the rows, the columns. Uh, Mr. Levy? OK, great. Whilst, we, whilst Mr. Levy gets to the microphone, shall I acknowledge former Minister of Agriculture, um, now Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Christopher Tufton. Welcome, sir. I haven't had the experience of Dr. Stanberry of living in Vera, but I feel some of his feeling What's happening in Vere, in Clarendon, is really tragic. Not just the wastage of the land, which is bad enough, to see all that land thrown down that was once in vibrant cane, much of it, but the wastage of people there. So I utterly sympathize with you, Donovan, and your feelings. What I rise to say, though, beyond that, is that I don't think it's entirely fair to the cooperatives, and I have to acknowledge I was associated with the sugar worker cooperatives, so I'm biased, obviously. <laughs> Not entirely fair to sweep the failure of the private sector to lump it with that of the cooperatives. The private sector had massive amounts of capital for their investment, and the conditions we see today are largely the effects, the consequences of private sector failure. And the consequences are disastrous. The crime in Westmoreland, for example, which is where I was mostly located. I wasn't actually in the, the Monimus area. Unfair to lump it also because, lump the cooperatives with the private sector, because in fact, by 1980, one of the three estates, and remember that the co-ops did not have the factories, they had only the land. One of the three, which was Bernard Lodge, was actually breaking even in terms of its operations. Largely because Social Action Center, from which I was operating then, was able to give the kind of guidance, financial guidance that they needed, and because the staff at Bernard Lodge were not so hostile to the workers. The staff at Money Musk and Froome were extremely hostile sabotage a lot of the efforts of the workers because they wanted the land. They had hoped to get the land. And in fact, that was perhaps what Prime Minister Shearer had intended, to break up the lands into larger lots for those farmers, 150 acres, 200 acres. And Manley himself, Michael, may have intended also because when he said, I am passing the land over to the workers. It was the managers he met by workers. Social Action Center took him literally workers as the field workers. And of course, that was very naive and completely mistaken. So because of that opposition, because of the lack of 
of capital investment. There was capital invested in the, uh, what do you call it, the, the separation of that workers could get, uh, and they got it, much to their delight. But the workers did not have people taking prayer larceny into their hands because they had the support of the community. And they were attempting to put some of the marginal lands into other crops, into fish farming, for example, into cassava, and so on. And they were agitating for water to come, to be brought down from North Clarendon to irrigate land which was suffering from the infiltration of salt, some of Clarendon being very low level and so on, and cassava being a sturdy crop that could, could perhaps, Dr. Stanberry can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> do better on that kind of soil, certainly could do better than sugarcane. So I, I'm, the debt that the cooperatives led, left, there was a debt, but it was small, nothing near to what the private sector left on the state. Perhaps he has the data. I look forward to reading his book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Levy. And if you look at my thesis, you will see Horace Levy quoted many times. But um, I wasn't necessarily comparing the cooperative uh, with the private sector in terms of the magnitude of failure. I was simply making the point that before the last round of privatization in the 2008-2010 period, there were two failed government interventions. One of them was a cooperative experiment, which by the way, in terms of intention, was quite noble. I mean, to put 60,000 acres of land in the hands of sugar workers at the time. People were denied ownership, people were brutalized, and workers slaves for nothing. In fact, my book is dedicated to those people like my great-grandmother and those people and my grandmother who work like slaves and die almost, if they didn't have children to take care of them, they would die paupers. It was revolutionary and, transform and transformational problem with the cooperative why it failed. One, the hostility from the people who were expected to provide the managerial services. That is well documented. Two, they were given a raw deal. When you give a man land and money must and tell him to go and plant cane and land suffering um, from saline intrusion, there is no way they could get the productivity to make money. So, while Bernard Lodge might have been a unique case, Frome and Money Musk um, did not achieve the objectives in terms of profitability and so on. So that was one experiment that in my view failed. Noble as the intention was. The first run of privatization in 1993 to 94 was a different approach. It was not cooperatives, but it was literally handing the assets, including factories, to, to, to private individuals. And that also failed. <clears throat> As I said, within four years, <clears throat> the estates were handed back to the government for a dollar, but with a $2.8 billion debt. So the point I was making is that the two interventions by government up to the last one, which is more the subject of this book, were in fact failure. I wasn't necessarily comparing the magnitude of failure. Okay. We, we have time for one more question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Stanberry or the minister or both, could you say something about the experience of the Chinese investment in Froome and Monimus factories? It, from what 
appears in the media, it looks as if it has also been a failure, but there hasn't really been any substantive empirical data on it. Could you say something about this? Well, Dr. Bernard, I suspect you're, on, you're asking that question knowing the answer. But, <coughs> read chapter 7. Quite wise. <laughs> but it's the tough one. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I first have to start by congratulating Dr. Stanberry and to say that this is a very personal story for the majority of the Jamaican people. And I feel that we have not really left the plantation in so many aspects. So my question, two questions. One, can you say a little about the differential impact of what you have seen on the ground in terms of what women and men experience. And secondly, <clears throat> you said, you quoted this economist who said, economic trumps over sentiment and love. It seems therefore, if we must redress this situation, we have to have an entirely new approach, understanding, empathy, commitment to the majority of the people of this country, black people who have labored at the plantation. What is required to turn this around? <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Lynette. Um, I was on the Lynette's tutelage for a while, and so I was wise enough in the data gathering to ensure that I differentiated um, every data I gathered along gender lines. <clears throat> the truth is, the decline in sugar affects men and women in different ways. The men take to stealing, ganja, and everybody knows here that there's a thriving, I hope I can go back there and preach on Sabbath. There's a thriving, um, you know, this gun for exchanging animals. That's why I preached that last night, so I envy People trade animals for arms from Haiti, etc. So the men tend to move to the nefarious kind of activities. But the woman, like my grandmother, who had the responsibility to make sure that the families are held together, it would, I'm not an emotional person, but it would tear your heart to see women in bushes cutting wood to burn cane. Coal, to, to burn coal, yes. Um, Women hustling. Migration from there is a serious thing. Some of them run to go to America and send out barrel and that kind of thing. Because the women have always found a way to survive legally. And they'll do anything that is required to make sure that there's food on the table. The men give up and find themselves in all kinds of criminal activities. And unfortunately, our peaceful community is now the subject of all kind of frequent curfews and so on. Many guys I grew up with are under, either in the grave or in prison. And so it's a very difficult space. But I salute the women of here who have found a way to survive. What you have said about, 
I don't want to leave the private sector because people are in business to make money. And I don't blame the European Union if this thing is costing them too much to be friendly to former colonies. <clears throat> Their economic interests are going to prevail. And that is where and that is why, and I think Richard Brennan alluded to it, the pure market doesn't work anywhere. It's not the most efficient allocator of resources. Well, the economists tell us that. But if you want to be just, and if you want to be equitable, governments have to step in. And we're not saying that you must hold on people and take away their money. But governments have to find creative ways to make sure that the most vulnerable are protected. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Principal, other members of the university community. I want to begin by uh, recognizing uh, Dr. Stanberg for his uh, work. Looking forward to reading the book. I apologize for not being here earlier to hear all the presentations. So I might be repeating what has already been said. But I, I certainly want to recognize him for his leadership uh, certainly during my tenure as minister, as we attempted to put sugar or sugar cane, as the case may be, on a, another path for sustainability. Um, I, I wanted him to comment on the, and maybe he did before I came, but the, 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 the purpose of the last attempt at divestment um, and how the approach to divesting uh, was taken to essentially convert what may have been a going economic activity, but more socioeconomic than economic. The truth is that the industry had gotten to a stage where, unless it was heavily subsidized, um, it, it really just could not function. Um, certainly the government-owned entities. Um, and in a sense, when we attempted to dispose of the assets, uh, when it was exposed to a potentially willing buyer, there were not many takers because a sale is really a function of a willing buyer and a seller. And again, it may have come across in the presentations, the, the Chinese, someone asked about the Chinese earlier, I think what represented the fourth stop. I think we started with Infinity Bioenergy out of Brazil, then we traveled to Italy, um, Eridania. We approached, I think, a US entity, Diamond, I think they were, understood that they flew over the helicopter and didn't bother to land. Um, having just looked at the state of the estates. And, uh, you know, eventually we ended up by having the Chinese and, of course, a local group that came in. And we, 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 we almost would pay them to take the, the assets that were left here because essentially the assessment was that even though we had a big value on it, they didn't think that it had valued too much. But more fundamentally, there was an attempt at transformation. There was the Wint Report, which I don't know if you mentioned in your, I'm sure you probably would have mentioned it in your book, which was intended, this is Alvin Wint, Professor Alvin Wint, to, to recalibrate the framework for which sugar should function and made recommendations that essentially were not followed through on, were not carried out. And essentially, therefore, we divested, anticipated that the new players would follow a different path, and that path was not taken, hence leading to one of two options, either the government moving in to take over again, as was done before, which I don't think any government, whichever political administration would want to do, or we would end up in the situation that we are in now. And I just wondered whether or not the analysis captured that aspect of 
why we are where we are today, and that is that we did not follow what was recommended to be followed in terms of trying to make sugar or the industry viable, having pursued a path that over time became a subsidized social operation as opposed to an economic operation, which would not be viable over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We did, in fact, together work very long and hard uh, to make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, divestment is not a simple thing. We have to go and find assets. We have to get titles for them, ensure, um, get valuation. We do a number of rounds of advertisement and so on and so forth. In hindsight, though, Prime Minister, I think that there is no way that the government could carry, well, not in hindsight, even from then, I knew that. There is no way that the government could, can, could continue to carry on the national budget um, nearly $40 billion worth of debt. And that is in the post FinSAC period. So the motivation for divestment was overwhelmingly fiscal. And we work hard and we achieve that. And the book gives the government every commendation in terms of the social programs that we undertook. Spending over nine billion in sugar dependent communities over a short time is not a small thing. I mean, I even became a contractor. I became a, I had to go to Westmoreland every week and the road, making sure that houses were built, you know, having NEPA suing me and Ministry of Health suing me, uh, you know. I was at the ministry one day, I said, somebody come with salmon. And I said, I don't know, I don't hold any pity maintenance. Why, why, somebody, why somebody come with salmon for me? You know, because, you know, sewage thing was not proper. So it was hard work. But all of that was necessary but not sufficient. When I examine what... Mauritius, Belize, and other countries face with the same challenges did. I think where we fail, Minister, is that divesting and putting, in, putting the assets in private hands, that is necessary but not sufficient. We have to put the policy framework in place to incentivize those who took over the assets to invest in the co-products of sugar. So for instance, well, this is all in the cleaner, so I can talk it here. So for instance, Richard at separate put in a, a modern boiler that could generate electricity uh, through um, cogeneration, right, the bagasse. But until this day, the, every effort to get a willing agreement to use that energy elsewhere in this big empire has not materialized. As much as we say a lot about the Chinese in chapter seven, in fairness to them, they built brand spanking brand new co-generation facilities, both in Frome and in Monimusk and were never able to get the, what do you call the PP power purchase agreement because there were peculiarities with the sugar industry. One of the peculiarities that we couldn't generate the energy all year. But we have seen cases where countries recognize that um, you have to give that kind of incentive and support to fledgling industry um, until they pick up. And I think that is where we have really dropped the baton. We had an E10, that was good. We had an E10 mandate in law. But people don't just get up and just start producing ethanol like that without incentives. And what happened? The people benefited from the E10 mandate, but not the sugar industry. Those were the people who quickly seized the opportunity 
to buy wet ethanol from Brazil, Comir and Dryte, which is a not much value added, and then they go and sell petrojam or wherever the ethanol. One of the fundamental reasons, as far as I can recall, for the eating mandate was precisely to help the sugar industry. So, government don't have to do it with money, but we can come up with creative policies that can encourage certain kinds of investment. Finally, right now, my friend Carl James there, um, the people in Belize, they have done what they were supposed to do. They face the same challenge of a collapsed market. <clears throat> they made the investment, they plant more cane, they move up the value chain, start doing plantation white sugar. <clears throat> and although they had the established capacity to sell that white sugar, of which we consume nearly 200,000 all over the Caribbean, <coughs> sorry, they were frustrated because countries which shall remain nameless chose not to apply the CET that would give them some protection in favor of buying cheap sugar from elsewhere. No, if we're not willing to make sacrifice and if we're not willing to put in the policies to force certain action, then we're not going to reap the benefits. And the questions are finished, but I said one last thing. <laughs> the Gleaner stopped short of calling me anachronistic once for daring to suggest that there is still value in the sugar industry. And I said, no, even now, we still can build a stronger industry than we now have on the basis of the versatility of the sugar cane with the many, many co-products. But it involved the private investment. It involved somebody taking cane farmers seriously because the investment we have had in the last divestment is nice factories refurbished. We can't blame the Chinese or anybody. Factories were refurbished and money spent. And everybody forget that you can make sugar without cane. That's not my quote, that's Carl James. You have to provide a pool of funds for farmers, especially small farmers, given the profile, to be able to grow the plant to supply the throughput. So, Minister Tufton, I said this to my boss here. We work hard and long, and you were a very hard taskmaster, I should tell you that. But I learned so much from you. We work long and hard to get the thing done, but sometimes we spend our energies in out in the fires, fighting the crises, and the more strategic things, we just don't get around to doing them. Probably that is why I left the ministry, so that with hindsight now, we can have a different approach. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I feel full. <laughs> Clearly, the high level of discourse is indicative of the fact that the, the, the content, the subject matter that has been put um, before us today is of such relevance, such importance to the lives of ordinary people. And this is what the Academy is meant to do, to research and to present um, findings on issues that are pragmatic and that are real to the people. And this is what we do here at the UWI. And if it is that you wish to enroll in a master's program or a PhD program to be able to write like Dr. Stanford, please enroll in one of our faculties here as UWI Mona. <laughs> we have a number of presentations. I'm going to invite Ms. Graham from the Jamaica Information Service to come, and I'm going to ask the author to make a presentation uh, to her. And then afterwards, Stephen Stanbury and friends will entertain us. So to principal, I don't know, Dr. Paul Carr is not here. Uh, Minister, Tuf Minister Tufton, mm -hmm. I think we need to make a presentation to you, sir. But you step out, so. Okay. Let's do principal for the oh, Mona okay. Library.
Until Minister come, those people were so invaluable to me in data collection. Sir George Callahan. Peter Knight. Oh. And the most inspired minister I've ever worked with, Minister Tufton. Hard <laughs> taskmaster was very inspiring. And of course, to the minister, and the scholar will prove that I have not lost my political sensitivities. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, as a wrap up, let me just acknowledge. Um, first of all, our MC, who like myself, flee government and took refuge here, <laughs> believing we were coming to something easier. <laughs> so you're not. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maurice. To Principal Weber, um, not only as my boss, but as my PhD supervisor. I was able to do this PhD in four years part-time with a hectic job, not because I was so bright, but because of his astute leadership and expert supervision. Thank you very much, Principal. <coughs> of course, to uh, my MP and Minister, thanks so much for coming, sir, and I stand ready to work with you for free. <laughs> for free, whatever we can to bring the sugar industry back. I want to thank the <coughs> great number of people from the industry who are here today. Um, for Mr. Robert Clark from Worthy Park, Mr. Bandui from Seprod, Mr. Armstrong from uh, Pan-Caribbean, um, Mr. Mary from the Kane Farmers Association, Mr. Carl James from the Sugar Association of the Caribbean, and uh, perhaps this is a long time the sugar fraternity ever met like this, and I hope it's not for the funeral, but to sow the seeds of a, of a renewed industry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Many, many Sundays when I sit to write, I see my wife and son doing chores, and I just write, and sometimes I feel guilty. I don't live strong on a Sunday. Thank you very much, Colleen. And uh, Mr. Chair, my son is not a student. He's a graduate. And thank you very much, Stephen, for showing the world that I spend money on you in music school. <laughs> And to a lady who is my mentor and mother, Mrs. Valda Gill, who when I was cavalier about going to Russia to study, she set me straight, and I'm eternally grateful for that. And a lady called Mrs. Judith Maloney, is she still here? Who is the president of my fan club, not a celebrity, but um, my biggest supporter, Mrs. Maloney. And to all the many um, members of the Udabar community, Mr. Archie, who rallied with the team to make sure that this, uh, was, this happened this evening. Um, Tracy Hamilton and associates who were great in terms of organizing logistics of this function. To the team from UETV, from MITS here, um, from estate management. I mean, we just come and sit down, but it was a lot of work that went on behind the scenes. To my friends, my church family, my local flock, many of whom are here today, and to other family members who I suspect are tuning in live on uh, UW by Mona Media, thank you all very much. God bless you. Thank you for coming.
right, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Stanbury. Stephen, my apologies. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it was so good having you uh, here this, this, this afternoon. We trust that you found it as beneficial. And I, it, there is no way I can end without reminding you to purchase a copy of the book. And when you shall have purchased it, please go to chapter 7. <laughs> By the way, sure, um, I don't know. This, is, this tells you how good a salesman I am. So the book is on Amazon. And... Uh, I'm advised by the bookshop here at UWI that within two weeks there'll be copies in the in the UWI library. Thank you very much for your support. As we close, please allow me to pay kudos to UETV that's broadcasting our event here live today. And as I invite you to now refresh yourselves and talk, and as you do that, please remember to observe the protocols. We're going to be doing that to the uh, musical uh, climbs that Stephen Stanbury and friends will be providing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Have yourselves a good evening, and please refresh yourselves. And remember to purchase a copy of the book. Thank you, and good evening.